Hi, this is the One Way Nova lecture, the second one. So the last time we talked about a setup which is referred to as the cell means approach, and today we are going to talk about a different way of setting up a One Way Nova model using the GLM, and it is called the factor effects. So make sure you're ready for this. Can you close your eyes and just instantly visualize the cell means style of model for a One Way Nova? It should come to you just automatic by now. If not, please revisit the One Way ANOVA. Um, specifically, what I want you to focus on from that lecture is make sure you understood the contrasts that were set up, specifically the contrast to test the main effect for, I believe I've called it A, the main A effect. Okay, just uh, we're focusing on the left hand side. Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about two way ANOVAs, but for now we're talking about this one way ANOVA. Basically, you have multiple levels. These could be multiple groups. So we could be studying reaction time for two groups of patients and also a group of controls. Whereas a two-way ANOVA, this is a two by three, we have two levels of B. This could be male and female gender, patient group one, patient group two, and controls. So again, we'll talk about two-way ANOVA next time. Today, we're gonna to finish up the one-way ANOVA. So the cell means model is what we talked about last time, and it is exactly modeling the mean for each of the cells. So I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. It's giving us these cell means, the mean reaction time for group one, for group two, and so on. So you directly get those means from this model. The EVs, or regressor, EV stands for explanatory variable, they're very intuitive, but the contrast can be a bit trickier. So specifically the contrast for the traditional ANOVA um, test of an overall uh, main effect of A uh, we showed last time was not completely intuitive for setting up. Uh, the factor effects on the other hand looks like this. So maybe you've seen this equation before. You start with an overall mean. So this is always modeled with a column of ones. And then you have a, um, a factor for, and this is going to model basically how each level differs from the overall mean. So it's a slightly different approach. I will have a figure that illustrates this in a little bit. So the regressors in this setup are a little, you need a little bit more thought. I'm basically going to give you a set of steps that you just simply follow. If you follow those steps every time you set up your regression, you'll be fine. And here they are. So in general, first of all, you always start with a column of ones. So I'm glossing over that here. I'm focusing on the rest of the regressors in the model. So after your column of ones, the remaining number of regressors is equal to the number of levels in your factor minus one. So the example I'm using today is a factor with four levels. So I will have three regressors. I need three. And here's the general setup. In your regressor, you need to fill in a one or a minus one, sometimes zeros. Some setups do not have zeros. Um, you only have ones and minus ones. And for each row, each regressor is going to correspond to a specific uh, level. So that's what this I is. So with my first regressor, I might focus on level one, and then you choose a baseline level. And in this case, I usually just choose the last one. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. I'm choosing level four. So all of these are in comparison to level four. And for each row then for this regressor, I'm going to give the regressor a value of one if it's from the level I'm currently on, a negative one if it's from level four, and a zero otherwise. So it's almost easier just to look at one of these design matrices. All right, uh, same as before, I have two subjects in each of four groups, so that's what this um, dependent variable is showing. I have my column of ones, which in this case will be the mean, um, as long as you follow these rules, and as long as, it will be the mean as long as uh, the sum down each column is zero. I'm not going to get into that. Let's just assume we have balanced data today, meaning the same number of observations for each cell. Anyway. So, following the rules, level four is my reference, so you can see that level four has a negative ones for each regressor. This first regressor corresponds to level one, so I have ones for level one, zeros for levels two and three, and then negative one for four. The 
the second regressor is focusing on level two, so I only have ones for level two, negative ones for four, zeros everywhere else, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and again, just to repeat, if you don't have balanced data, start with this structure and then mean center. Um, hmm, yeah, we'll cover that another time. I don't want to get into that today. Okay. So what do betas two, three, and four mean? Well, we'll get there. It's easier to instead focus on the separate group means. So remember the trick I showed you before where you can get the contrast for each group. You can just strip it directly off your design matrix. Just a reminder of how that works. You look at your design matrix and you look at each row for each subject within a group. So I'm going to focus on group one, so it's the first two rows. And you say to yourself, hey, are the rows of the design matrix e equal? Are they the same for each subject in that group? The answer is yes. Every subject who's in group one has a 1100 zero, zero across the rows. Likewise for subject two, it's 1010 one, zero, and so on and so forth. Therefore, I know that for su uh, subjects in group one, the contrast for the mean of group one will be beta one plus beta two. I got it directly from multiplying this first row times this vector. So beta one plus beta two is the mean for group one. Continue this trick. The mean for group two is beta one plus beta three. Again, I get that directly from the design matrix because the rows of the design matrix are exactly the same for each subject within group two. So that is my contrast that gives me the mean for group two. For group three, you should already have that in your head. It's going to be beta one plus beta four. And group four, this one looks really weird, right? So it's going to be one minus one minus one minus one, which is beta one minus beta two minus beta three minus beta four. So here's what this model is doing. You can see each of these betas is describing the group mean according to how it differs from the overall mean, which is beta one. Then there's this weird thing where group four, it didn't have a regressor in the model. And the reason is we, we didn't need one. It would be overparameterized because you only need, if you have an overall mean in the model, how many more pieces of information do you need to fully characterize your data? Well, I have four groups, but if I know the means of three of the groups and the overall mean, I can use that to get the mean for the fourth group. It's sort of like this game, um, uh, two numbers sum to 10, one of the numbers is two. You can tell me the other number is eight. So it's the same type of idea. So I'll draw a picture here. Um, beta one is the overall mean of the data. Each of these points is the mean for each group. Um, so this is my mean for group one up here. So you can see that you get up there by starting at beta one and adding beta two. Likewise, to get to the mean of group two, which is right here, you take beta one and add beta three. Uh, beta four is negative in this case, so I would add beta one to beta four to get the mean of group three. The mean of group four is then beta one, and the dif difference is actually the sum of all of these um, values, beta two, beta three, and beta four, sum together. Um, So if we want to test the mean of group one greater than zero, we've already covered this. So the contrast for that, I'll give you a second. Okay, your second's up. Hopefully you guessed one, one, zero, zero. Now what if you wanted to compare the mean for group one greater than the mean for group four? So you can use this, well first we need a zero on one side. So I'm going to subtract the mean for, of group four from both sides. And again, this is a little different than how we started. We started with betas in these equations. And now, since these means are actually linear combinations of the betas, I'm going to keep, I'm going to make my life easy. I'm just going to express things in terms of means for now, and then I'll fill in the betas later. Anyhow, I have the mean for group one minus the mean for group four greater than zero. Everything's set up right. My inequality points at zero. And now all you need to do is you take the contrast for the mean of group one and you subtract the contrast vector that is the mean for group four, which is why I covered subtracting matrices a while ago. So group one is one, one, zero, zero. 
Again, I just get that from the design matrix. Group four is one, minus one, minus one, minus one. So if I subtract these two, I get zero, two, one, one. Okay, I'll let you look at that for a second. So one minus one is zero, one minus negative one is two, zero minus negative one is one, zero minus negative one is one. So pretty much you can get anything in terms of comparing cell means. Now, here's where this model is super easy. If you want the main effect of factor A, you construct an F test. These tests are always F tests. And all you do is you construct an F test that one by one plucks out the regressors that modeled the main effect of factor A. So we want to compare each beta to zero. So it just looks like this. So this first contract contrast or first uh, row in the contrast is pulling out beta two. The second row pulls out beta three and then beta four. This is your contrast matrix, which then will be used for the F test for the main A effect. So go back and compare this to the main A effect for um, the cell means, and that was a bit more difficult. The equivalent, that one should also have three contrasts in it, and it will. Um, things should always match. You should have, if there are equivalent ways of setting up models, both models must have the same number of regressors. And they must have, um, if you're running F-tests, the same number of contrasts, the same number of rows in the contrast matrix. All right, make sure you have all of that. Do you recall the steps for setting up the regressors using the factor effects approach? So how do you create those regressors of ones, zeros, and minus ones? Make sure you have that down. And what's easier with factor effects compared with cell means? What's the benefit of using factor effects? Last, what's the trick for quickly grabbing the contrasts for the group means off of the design matrix? You don't even have to think. You can just see it and grab it. Make sure you can do that as well. That's all I got. Once again, please join the Facebook group. Um, it's called Mumford Brain Stats. And thanks for your time, and I hope you have a fabulous day.